I walked down to the church building, as I've been doing every Sunday for the past three and a half decades, and uh, I got stopped by the longest coal train I think I've ever seen. It was slow. And when you're walking, you really don't want to stand right there by the tracks and wait for the train. So I, I picked the shade tree that was closest, and I stood under that until, I don't know what was pulling it at the beginning, but there were two big old locomotives pushing it at the end, and I could hear them coming. But uh, that's just part of it, isn't it? Sometimes you catch the train. Anybody else see that train? Somebody else got stuck in it, yeah. It was a doozy, wasn't it? I haven't seen one that long or that slow in a long time. It was both. We'll be in Jeremiah chapter 3. Uh, please find that in your Bible, and then you can get out your notes as we talk about return to me. There's 152 verses in the Bible that say return to me or return to the Lord or something similar to that. And uh, Kathy and I read them all. By the way, Kathy helped more with this sermon than she normally does because it was a ladies' day subject and she was interested. And so we enjoyed uh, going through that together. But out of all those, read all those passages, they're all great. But when I saw Jeremiah 2 and 3, like I mentioned this morning, that's like an old friend to me. I just love this passage so much. And probably because of the impact it had on me when... Somebody studied it with me, and I remember going to a Bible study where we went through this, and it was about comparing our relationship with God to the husband-wife relationship, and it just made so much sense. And I've done this study many times. I don't think I've preached on this here before. I couldn't find where I had, but anyway, great passage and great theme, return to me. We do want to reach out to those who are backslidden, those who are falling away from the Lord. And so this message is geared specifically toward those people. I've obviously, I've talked to a lot of people who have fallen away over the years, trying to help them to come back to the Lord. And so I have my thoughts that I could present. But I think it's so much better to just see the Scripture that deals with, with so much of what we're trying to communicate and when, when this sermon is done this evening, we'll have two sermons on our YouTube channel that we can tell people, go and, and watch this, and uh, maybe this will help you with some things. Because uh, we do want to help those who have lost their way, the good people. Uh, that have just lost their way, just have uh, got sidetracked, and it's so easy to do. I know we've got several here who have been down that road themselves and experienced that. Uh, you just get out of the habit of going to church, and then it's hard to get going again. And to some of you, that probably sounds funny, doesn't it? It's hard to go to church. It's not that hard. I mean, you, you get dressed, you get in your car, you go down to church. It sounds real easy. No, once you've broken that pattern, it's really hard to get back into that again. You've got to really plan. You don't just... Sunday morning, okay, I'm just going to go to church. You've got to plan and be ready so that something doesn't interfere with this and say, I'm really going to go this time. And been with a lot of people down that road. We're going to talk about our third point, which is crawling out of the filth. And so uh, we're going to look at Scripture, not just personal opinion. Here's what the Bible says to help somebody who is caught up in worldly things, and by filth, I don't necessarily mean uh, vulgar sins. It could just be worldliness, just caught up in, I got to pay the bills, and I got to get to the doctors, and I got to do all this stuff, and so I don't really have time for the Lord, uh, those types of things. So, number one under that, God is under no moral obligation to forgive you and take you back. That may sound like a strange point to you, but look at chapter 3, verse 1. God says, if a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he return to her? Will not the land be completely polluted? But you're a harlot with many lovers, yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. 
So what's happening is some of the people that Jeremiah is preaching to and sharing, they're thinking, you know, we really need to come back to the Lord. And God is saying, now, before you do, think about what you're asking me to do. Would you ever ask a husband who had a wayward wife? I mean, she just runs off on him, treats him like dirt, uh, goes off, runs off with another man. Would he really be obligated to take her back after she did that to him? And his point was, no, from a human point of view, we can understand that. How somebody would do that. Because as that's what you're asking me to do, as we're going to find out, he's willing to do it. But it's important for us to understand why does God have to take you back? I think the first thing you have to get clear in your mind is God is not under any moral obligation to take you back. He doesn't have to take any of us. Okay? He, he will because he's a loving and compassionate God. But not because, okay, I just ha you've been so good, I just have to take you back. Okay? It's not that situation at all. It's quite the opposite. After what we've done, and that's the point he's making, you know, would, should, should a person do this? A husband do this? He says, would not the land be polluted? He says, you're a harlot with many lovers. And he's talking to the nation of Judah. Yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. Here's what happens, number two. You sin and sin and sin, and before long, just doesn't phase you anymore. Read on with me in verse two. Lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see. Where have you not been violated? I mean, the Bible's pretty blunt here. By the roads you have sat for them like an Arab in the desert, and you have polluted a land with your harlotry and with your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withheld, and there's been no spring rain, yet you had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Have you not just now called to me? My father, you are the friend of my youth. Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Behold, you have spoken, and you have done evil things, and you have had your way. And that's really what it's about, isn't it? You have had your way. We get caught up in sin, and we sin, and pretty soon it just doesn't phase us anymore. I don't know if you have caught yourself in a sin one time and say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That was really wrong, and you feel bad about that. But if you don't repent of that sin and you just keep doing it, what happens is it bugs you less and less, and you harden your conscience against that type of sin. And the way he compares that, he says it's like a harlot's forehead. If you've ever seen the, the, the brazen eyes of a prostitute where she don't care anymore, you know, she sinned and sinned and sinned. It just doesn't bother her anymore. He says, you refuse to be ashamed. Things that people do that they ought to be so embarrassed about, and they're not even blushing about it. Maybe even bragging about their sin. That's the type of situation that he's describing here. We've got to make sure that sin has an impact on us, that we see it for, for the horrible thing that it really is. Until sin is bitter to you, Christ will not be sweet. Until sin is bitter to you, Christ will not be sweet. Number three. It's not just unfaithfulness to God, the harlotry that he describes here, that pollutes the land. It's one acquired weakness after another. He says that in verse 2. He says, and you have polluted a land at the bottom of verse 2 with your harlotry and with your wickedness. So what happens is a, a land, whatever that land, let's just say the United States, for instance. Okay, there's a land. Starts moving further and further away from the Lord. Starts voting in, accepting one wickedness after another. And God is sitting back and just shaking his head. You know, when a person makes one mistake here or a mistake over there, that's one thing. God can, he can live with that. But the persistence of a nation involved in wickedness, not just the harlotry, not just prostituting ourselves with pagan gods, and by 
pagan gods. I hope you understand. I don't just mean bowing down to an idol. In chapter 2, we read about how they're calling wood their father, you know, and bowing down to stone. And how we think that's so dumb. And yet, is it any more intelligent to bow down to the almighty dollar and say, you are my God? Or to, to bow to any number of things? Uh, we've got to make sure that, uh, that we understand this wickedness, compiled wickedness, pretty soon God just says, okay, if that's the way you want to go, like he says in Romans chapter 1, I will give you over to that sin. If you're going to persist in that, I'll give it over to you. Let me read you a, a scripture. This is not in your notes, but this is at Solomon's dedication of the temple. It says, then here in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. When they sin against you, for there is no man who does not sin, I like that. And you're, you're angry with them and deliver them to an enemy so that they take them away captive to the land of the enemy far off or near. If they take thought in the land where they have been taken captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of those who have taken them captive saying, we have sinned and have committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly. If they return to you with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their enemies who have taken them captive and pray to you toward their land which you have given to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the house which I have built for your name, then hear their prayer and their supplication in heaven, your dwelling place, and maintain their cause. Now chronologically, we've jumped way, way back in time. This is long before Jeremiah comes along. This is back in the days of Solomon, the son of David. And remember, David wasn't allowed to build the temple because he was a, a man of blood. He was a soldier. And so he says, you're not going to build my temple, but your son will. So here's Solomon, his son, builds the temple. But as he's dedicating the temple, he's saying, now God, there may be a time where we don't do your will and we don't follow you like we're supposed to. And your, your word promises, it says, that if we don't do that, other nations will come in, you'll step back, you'll, you will withdraw your protection, other nations will have us, and they'll carry us off into captivity. I, he knew that. Every Jew knew that. Every Jew knew that that was a possibility. If, if the nation did not follow God, God wouldn't protect them anymore. Okay? And so that's what he said, this could happen. But if that happens... Allow us to return to you. Give us a way to come back. I know we sin. I know we do the wrong thing. But, but give us a heart that wants to come back and help us to return with all of our heart and with all of our soul. Let's look at number four here. It is really unrealistic to believe things will go well for you when you habitually refuse to follow his commands. And I touched on this this morning, or the, the Bible actually touched on it in chapter 2. In chapter 3, we see this again. And verse 3, Therefore the showers have been withheld, and there has been no spring rain, yet you had a harlot's forehead, and you refused to be ashamed. That withholding of the blessing of God is happening because they're not following him. And they are perpetually not following him. Notice I, I chose my words there. The, you, we habitually refuse to follow his commands. And, and maybe refuse is too strong of a word. We, we habitually decline to follow his commands. Because sometimes it's not just that a person is just refusing. It's not like somebody saying, I just don't want to do the will of God. But we choose other things. Remember the example I gave you this morning of, of here I am and I'm facing God and I love God and I, I'm listening to him, but I've got these other voices around me that are, are telling me to do things. Okay, I've got my doctor and he's telling me one thing and I've got uh, my teacher trying to tell me to do something else and I've got my boss talking to me about this or that and you need to get in and, and do this or that and I've, I've got all these other voices and pretty soon I, I'm turning towards those things and, and obviously these are important people we need to listen to what they say but when I'm following their voices and I'm not hearing God's voice or if they're telling me something that is contrary to what my God does 
If I make a mistake and I go this way, I can come back and, yeah, God, I'm so sorry I did this. And God will always take me back. But when I habitually do that, like over and over again, I'm just continually not listening to God, just totally ignoring Him. I am sacrificing my marriage to God. I'm divorcing myself from Him by my actions and by the voice that I am choosing to listen to. And I'm turning away from Him. I'm not facing God anymore. I have my back to God. This is the situation that a person finds himself in when they fall away from God. We see, ver uh, number five here, the core reason for turning away from God is wanting to have our own way. That's really what it boils down to is a lot of people, when they fall away, and say, okay, well, I'll, I'm going to make all the decisions here, and they kind of like that. He says at the bottom of verse five, and have done evil things, and you have had your way. You get to do what you want to do, and that's the way you want it. And God says, okay, if that's the way you want it, that's the way it's going to be. God never forces his will upon us. Uh, we have to be wise enough to choose it. All right, number six. Observe others who have fallen away, and then don't make the mistakes that they made. This is good advice. Starting in verse six of chapter 3, it says, Then the Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king. Have you seen what faithless Israel did? Now Israel at this time has been carried away into captivity. They did not do the will of God. He withdrew this protection from them, and the Assyrians came in 722 B.C. and took them away to captivity. This has already happened. So he says, Have you seen what Israel did? She went up on every high hill, under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. The idolatry in uh, Israel, in the nation of Israel, was uh, rampant. Verse 7, I thought, after she had done all these things, she will return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. So now he's not talking about Israel, he's talking about Judah, the two southern tribes. Watch what was happening. They saw that whole thing go on. She saw it, verse 8, and I saw that for all her adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away, and I've given her a writ of divorce. Notice again the, the marital reference there. I gave her a writ of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, and she went and was a harlot also. God says, you would think, Judah, watch what just happened to Israel and said, duh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make that same mistake. But she didn't. And we know not long after this is written, the Babylonians come in, they conquer Judah, carry them away into captivity. What's the, the application for us? You know, when you are around the streets of our community, and you see people who used to be members of the church here, and they've fallen away, and they're there. You know, I hope you will say, I don't want that to happen to me. I want to stay faithful to the Lord. Well, then look at the mistakes that they made, and then don't make those mistakes. Ask yourself, how does that happen? Somebody who at one time was very strong in their faith, and yet they have drifted away. How does that happen that a person drifts away? How would it happen to you? What would Satan have to do to you to get you to turn away from God? Whatever the answer to that question is, that's where you need to bolster your strength, your spiritual strength. That's where you need to build up strong and say, I need to be determined. Satan's not going to get me in this area. Maybe a, an area where he is tried and had some success in your life in the past. And you need to say, uh-uh, no, we're going to build that up strong right there. And he is not going to get me. Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you know what a lion does? A lion studies the herd. And then he picks out the weak, right? Picks off the weak. You don't want to be one of those weak. 
You don't want to be off on the edge. You want to be right in the middle of the herd. That's the best place to be. And so get yourself there spiritually. Maneuver yourself so you are right in the center of things. You are in your strength, in your faith. See the mistakes of those who have fallen away in the past and say, I'm not going to go down that road. Here's what I'm going to do. God's saying, I wish Judah would do that. Judah watched that whole thing with Israel. Turns around, does exactly the same thing. Making the same mistakes. All right. Number seven. You know, God is branded as cruel for divorcing himself from adulterous, faithless, and treacherous people. But God has to be true to his righteousness. We see this in verse 8, which I just read. I saw that for all of her adulteries, the faithless, I sent her away. I gave her a writ of divorce. We read that and say, oh man, that is so cruel by God. No, you don't understand. If he makes a vow, this is what's going to happen in his righteousness. He has to fulfill that. He is obligated by his own truthfulness. God is not capable of lying. He will never lie. And so if he says this is what's going to happen and you read it from God, we read it straight from his word, that's what's going to happen, good or bad, whether we like it or not, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that's what's happening here. It seems, you know, like God is, oh, he's so harsh. No, he's just true to his own righteousness. He is committed to the path of righteousness, just like he calls us to be committed to our path to righteousness. You take a marriage vow, you get married, you are obligated to your wife. You're obligated to your husband to fulfill that vow. No different with God. If you've been baptized into Christ, you made a vow with God. Whether you understood all that vow or not. How many of you, when you got married, understood everything there was about marriage? How many of you understood anything about marriage? <laughs> you didn't know. But you worked it out, didn't you? By the way, our anniversary is coming up. I didn't want to mention it this morning. I don't want to uh, dim the light for Regina and Bobby, but our, our 38th is coming up on this Thursday. And so that's quite a goal. It's not that hard for Kathy because I'm so easy to live with, obviously. But uh, it's been quite a goal. <laughs> no, it's been, been wonderful. 38 years together. Marriage is important. Very, very important. What's even more important than that is your relationship with God. That's important. You lose that, you lose everything. It all comes tumbling down. All right. Uh, let's, let's go on here to our last uh, main theme, and that is how to return to God. Let's get to the nuts and bolts. Let's say I recognize, yes, I've fallen away from the Lord. What do I need to do to return to God? And we need to. This scripture here in Isaiah chapter 31 says, Return to him whom you have deeply defected, those sons of Israel. And so we need to return to the Lord. How do we do that? Number one, understand that false repentance only makes God angry. So don't do it falsely. That's in verse 9. It says, because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adulteries with stones and trees. Yet in spite of all this treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. So Judah watched and said, oh, no, we don't want to do that, but, and comes back to the Lord, but only in deception. In other words, only in, uh, in pretense, <clears throat> only pretending. Oh, yeah, I'm here, God. You've never seen anybody just acting religious, have you, before? You ever seen that? I'll bet you have. I mean, their heart's really not in it, but, boy, they're going to go through the motions. That just makes God angry when that happens. If you're going to come back to the Lord, come back to the Lord. Be real. Be honest about it. Because God knows what's in your heart anyway. Really, you think you're going to pull the, the wool over his eyes? He knows already. Don't pretend. Come back to the Lord. Don't, don't make the mistake that Judah did here. Because God saw through it just that quick. Judah, you're really not coming back. Oh yeah, we really are. No, you're not. I can tell. God can tell. And so come back to the Lord 
with all your heart. Number two, if you're going to return to God, do it with your whole heart. That's what verse 10 is talking about. Judah did not return to me with all her heart, only in pretense, only in deception. It needs to be a wholehearted effort. Number three, you will be judged more strictly than others because they had less opportunity to know God than you have. So if you, being in the situation that you're in, and we just don't realize how blessed we are. First of all, to be in a country where it's not illegal to be a Christian, that's a great blessing. I know things are changing in our country, but so far we can still say that. It's not illegal to be a Christian or to practice what the Bible teaches. But just to be in Shakota, to be blessed, to be with this congregation, to fall away from this, there really is no excuse. There's none. And so that's why, now let's read the verse here in verse 11. It says, and the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Now think about that. The sin was worse in Israel. They were further away as far as obeying God's command. But he says, actually, Judah is worse. Why? Because in Judah was what city? Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? The temple, the priest. They have all that opportunity right there. And so that's why he says, faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I'm gracious, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity that you have transgressed against the Lord your God and have scattered your favors to the strangers under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. God says, I want you back so bad. I want you back. But you need to acknowledge your iniquity. You need to be able to admit, I've done wrong. I've sinned. And I blamed you, God, and I had no right to do that. And I blamed others, and I had no right to do that either. Yeah, people make mistakes. People maybe said what they shouldn't say. They did what they shouldn't do, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't do what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes we, we're too easy on ourselves as far as uh, these excuses we accept. Well, the reason I'm not doing so well spiritually is because of so-and-so over here. Man, if they get their act together, I could do better. No, you can get your act together anytime you want to. Anytime you decide, nobody here has any more bearing on my relationship with God than me and God. This is up to me and God. I decide how close I'm going to be to God, not you. Right? And the same thing is true with you. It's not anybody else around you. It's you and God. You decide how strong your marriage is going to be to God. You decide how strong that relationship is going to be, and then you pursue it. Not somebody else. It's not somebody else's fault. It's you and God. A few more scriptures here. Isaiah 19, verse 22 says, The Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing. So they will return to the Lord, and he will respond to them and will heal them. Let me show you another one here after this point. No, go ahead. Go back. Okay. For the reason you should repent, uh, the reason you should repent and return to God is because he is your husband. Verse 14, return, O faithless sons, declares the Lord, for I am your master. And I'll talk about that word here in a minute. I'm a master to you, and I will make you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. The word for master is actually Baal, a Hebrew word that means husband. I'm not sure why. It's not translated uh, husband all the time because it, it can mean master. It's not a bad translation. But in chapter 31 and verse 32, there it's translated husband. Why should you return to God? Because he is your husband. Why does God want you back? He says, I'm your husband. I love you and I want you back. Return to me. Come back to me. Now let me show you a couple other scriptures that go well with this. I have... 
wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Redeemed means I bought you back. Isaiah 44, verse 22. Then Isaiah 55, verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Beautiful thoughts there. One more in Lamentations. Let us examine and probe our ways, and let us return to the Lord. Very simply put, we can come back to God whenever we're ready. And there's no better time than right now. Let me say one other closing remark here, and then I'll, I'll quit. Put away detestable things and come back to the Lord. In chapter 4, it starts off this way. If you will return, O Israel, declares the Lord then you should return to me. And if you will put away your detested things from my presence and will not waver, and you will swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory. God's message over and over again is return to me. I want you back. And quite often you're going to hear, if you try to bring somebody back to the Lord who's fallen away, you'll hear something like, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how far away I am. I've really done some things to hurt God. You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can't change the past, but we can start right here today right now and you decide I'm going to get things right with God that can happen anytime man I love this passage I hope you love it too a lot of, of great things lessons for us to learn our God's message is always return to me anytime you're away whether it's a little bit or a long ways always God wants you to return to him and that's why we always offer an invitation which we're going to do you need to return to the Lord, but you need to do that humbly. You need to do that on bended knee, right? You need to do that acknowledging your sin and your iniquity so that you can surrender that to God, so that he can wipe that out, so you can start today clean, a brand new slate. You can start all over. If that's your desire, please come as we stand and sing.